All right, so we've had a kind of a break in our challenges for the year. We took August off, um, and there's going to be another break too. I don't have a full 12 challenges for the whole year, not yet. Maybe by next year we'll, we'll come up with 12. But we're going to continue our series. Now, the challenge that we're going to be doing for this month coming up for September I don't really see this as much of a challenge personally. I, I kind of look at this more of a standard. Uh, I'm not going to be giving out prizes for this particular challenge, but um, obviously it's not all about the prizes anyways. Um, all of these challenges have been tr you know, trying to teach important truths and, and um, just really incorporating more spiritual things into your life, just overall, trying to increase and improve in all various areas of the Christian life. And what I'm focusing on uh, this morning and this month is just your church attendance. So it's real simple. Uh, the name of my sermon this morning is Three to Thrive. It's a, it's a principle that, that I believe is, is very important. It's something that, that I think that everyone should be trying to, to live by and do. And I, honestly, I can't uh, overstate the importance of coming together and congregating as a church. This is one of the reasons I preached on this subject already, I think, a couple times in just, the, 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 just over a year this church has been around. And the reason for that is because I believe this is really important and it's critical for, to, to, for one, does it help prevent you from backsliding? Just coming up, just coming and showing up to church is going to help you to stay in the Christian life and, and to continue going year after year after year after year after year because this isn't a sprint. You may get very excited at different times in your life and man, man, you're going out soul winning, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing all this Bible memory, you know, you're on fire, but there's going to be times where that wears off and other things start grabbing your attention and you start getting drug away from the things of God. It happens. It happens because we're still in the flesh, for one. And our flesh is going gonna, is gonna to try to drag you away and there's going to be times where you're just not going to feel like doing the things of God because we have this sinful flesh. We need to have something to counteract that. One, obviously, you need to just have in yourself the character to say, I am going to continue. I am going to keep going. I am not going to stop. But one of the things that's going to really, 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 really help you in your spiritual life to stay in it for the long haul is coming to church. Coming to church regularly. And I believe, not you know regularly, but as often as you can. Look at Hebrews 10, verse number 25. The Bible says, actually, let's jump up real quick to verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's what church is, the assembling of ourselves together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The day of the Lord. Day of Christ, as that day approaches, we need to be congregating so much the more because perilous times are coming. There's great tribulation ahead. We need to be strengthened. That's why it says here to consider one another, provoking unto love and the good works. And th that's kind of more what I've focused on in the past, so I'm going to focus on other aspects of church this morning. But I don't want that to go unspoken either because that is a huge part of being in church is the provoking one another unto love and the good works. Being here for each other, being a spiritual family to be able to rely on each other, to encourage one another. When someone's starting to just maybe fade away a little bit spiritually, you've got other people to kind of help bring you back on track, help bring you back moving forward again. We need that. We need the encouragement. It's extremely important. Um, and I've taught, and I still believe this, you know, you need to decide for yourself what it means to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? And I, to me, that's just, you're coming regularly. Now, it doesn't have to be all three. I don't think that if you, if you don't come to all three services that we offer every week, that means you're forsaking the assembly. I don't believe that for a second, okay? But there is a time where you're going to say, 
yeah, you're forsaking the assembly. I mean, you can say, well, once a week, that's not forsaking. And I, and I fall into that camp. I agree with that. Coming once to church once a week, I don't think you're forsaking the assembling. Okay, if you're coming to church three times a month, I don't think you're forsaking the assembly, right? So when it comes to not sinning, you can, you can start going down. But then it's like, well, is once a year forsaking the assembly? Is once every five, you know what I mean? So obviously there's a cutoff where you'd be like, yeah, you're not, you're not going to church. Okay, it's, it's just not a normal thing for you to be going to church. You're forsaking the assembly that's gathering regularly. So um, God doesn't give us the exact number of like, you have to be here. But he doesn't do that for many areas. You know, there's a lot of areas that, that we can be in sin, but he doesn't give us the exact cutoff. One that people are like, well, how long is too long for a man's hair? Like, look, just let's not try to find that line. Let's not try to be looking for, well, how often can I be going to church and I'm still not forsaking the assembly? No, we need it so much the more as we see the day approaching. How about we just see, well, how many times can I be in church? Then, you're, then you know you're not going to be worried about forsaking the assembly when you're actually thinking about, well, I just want to be there as often as I can. That's going to help you out right there. But um, <clears throat> so for our challenge, my challenge is Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And I don't think that's much. This is what I say. I don't really consider this to be much of a challenge, although it may be for some people who aren't used to doing that. To me, that's a standard. And this is a standard that I've had in place for a really, 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 really long time before I even considered pastoring or anything like that just because I think it's that important. If you want to be rooted and you want to be strong in your faith, go get in church. Now look, I know that some people here, if you want to participate in this challenge, are driving considerable distances and you're not going to be able to make it here for like a Wednesday night service. I get that, but you know what I think you should do? Get in a church. Try to find it. For this challenge, at least, find a church that's close enough for you to get to and, and get in and, and attend a local church. Um, I, I do think it's I do think it's very important to do that, and then on top of that, so to try to make it a little bit more challenging, I'm going to say, plan on being at church at least ten minutes early to make sure you're not going to be missing any of the church. You can say, you know, a lot of people think like, well, I made it for the preaching, so I didn't really miss church. Like, well, you missed the singing, you missed the, you know, the the fellowship even before church starts. All of these things are important. And church isn't just preaching. Church is the whole package, right? We sing, you know, the Bible says to, to um, speak to other and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And this is part of our church service. And this is something that is important. Just even just singing will help you be in the right spirit for the preaching and just as part of church. It's, it's, part, of, uh, it's part of the service. So try to, try to plan on being here 10 minutes early for every service. And, uh, and then my last part for the challenge is to volunteer to help with at least one thing during that month. And just something really small, right? To just be more a part of what's going on here. I mean, it could be something as simple as just, hey, can I just take that trash out? Or just do it, right? You don't have to ask. L just the, the smallest of things to just be part of the whole functioning of the church, right? So uh, it's, it's a focus and a mindset for the month of making sure I'm putting church as a priority of being part of church and being in church. And if you have any vacations planned or anything like that, you know, I don't believe in taking vacations from God and just, well, I'm just going to get away from God for a while, which is why anytime we ever go anywhere, we look up, hey, where's the best church that I could go to? in the area that I'm going to vacation at. And sometimes vacations are built around, I'm going to that church. <laughs> so my vacation. But you don't have to get that extreme. Just if you plan on going somewhere, you know, say, well, I I'm not going to skip out on church just because I'm going to enjoy myself on vacation somewhere. Don't put God in the back seat like that. Yeah. And hopefully church isn't that bad for you that you feel like you need to to decide like, oh man i need a break from church look that your attitude's wrong
And look, even, even if you have to go somewhere that you don't really feel is a great church, okay, try to find the best one that you can, you still need to get that feeding. And I'm going to get into the whole, the whole feeding thing in a, in a little bit. But even churches that you feel like you're not being fed, go to church with an attitude that's like, I'm looking for the crumbs. Okay, maybe you're not getting the best full course meal from the Bible, from the scripture. Still go anyways. Go where there's other local believers gathering together. Be a blessing to them. Try to help out other people. And whatever you might be receiving from the message, from the preaching, try to pick up the crumbs and eat the crumbs. But that's way better than just not being in church at all. Now, uh, turn over, if you would, please, to um, Matthew chapter 16. Because we're going to look at some other reasons this morning on why church is important, other than just the provoking one another into love and to good works, which is extremely important in and of itself. And why I'm, I've been preaching sermon after sermon on just the importance of this and making sure you're coming to church. We're going to see the way that God deals with the church and, and, and everything that Jesus went through and, and the words that were spoken about church, about the church in the Bible to just help you prioritize and realize, yes, this is really important thing. That, that God views and values as being very precious and important. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus Christ said this, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. So we got to remember that first and foremost. Christ is at the head of the church. That's the authority structure. That, that is, it's, this is Christ's church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. It's his church. And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he wasn't saying upon Cephas, am I going to build my church? Upon Peter, as the Catholic church thinks, their church is built on man, not on God. Their church is built on a false version of, of biblical events and biblical truth. Their their church is not right starting from the very beginning and foundation of their church it's built on man that's why they have their their doctrines where they don't believe in um you know it, that the scripture is the source only for our beliefs and our practices they look to man they look to their popes they look to their church and their traditions and everything else to determine well, I mean, God's word isn't enough because there's also the Pope who can basically say what he wants as the vicar of Christ and, and you know, the, the, the pontiff. He can pontificate and, and tell what he says that the church should be doing and you have to treat that like it's, like it's on the same footing as the word of God. The word of man, in many cases, they put on the same equal footing as the word of God. And really what they're doing is superseding the word of God because any time that you know, the man institutes their, their rules or their religion, it, it's contradicting scripture anyways. So they're elevating the word of man above the word of God. Now, um, Jesus Christ said upon this rock, he was talking about himself. He's the rock. And we're going to prove that. Uh, you could turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. But not only that, he says... Because he's the rock, right? He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Boy, talk about wanting to be in a place where the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. How about being in Christ's church? Because you know that in the church, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse number 19. Because he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And I just want to show you real quickly obvious, that we all know and believe that that rock is Jesus Christ. But I'm just going to show you from Scripture to some other supporting verses that teach this very clear doctrine. And if you know any devout Catholics, 
then maybe you can use these verses sometime to show them because they, they love Matthew 16, 18 because they, they think that he's telling Peter that Peter's the rock. But Ephesians 2, verse 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So that rock that Jesus was mentioning is the stone that he's being referred to here as a chief cornerstone. Now, obviously, the apostles and the prophets were doing a lot of foundation work, but Jesus Christ is the chief corner, the principle. I mean, you cannot have the foundation being solid at all without Christ, without that chief cornerstone being there. That is the rock that is ultimately supporting everything. Uh, it says, in whom, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So Ephesians 2.20 there, of course, shows us that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the stone upon which the church is built. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Showing us one more time that Peter is not the foundation of the church. Christ is the foundation. He's referred to as the chief cornerstone in Ephesians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So basically in this passage, he's referring to, this is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And he's talking about, you know, you're going to build upon that foundation. And there's, there's all kinds of things you could do with your life and works that you can do that you're going to build and try to build up this spiritual house. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do it. He says, but, but you, no man can lay any other foundation than what's already been laid, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Your salvation, being saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's your, that's your foundation. That's your starting block to build up off of. So from that moment forward, once you're saved, you can build, you can do works, you can do things and accomplish building something for God. But it all has to start, because if you don't have the foundation right, none of it's going to stand. It's all going to go away. But Jesus Christ being that foundation, he's the chief cornerstone of the church. Let's move on here. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. I'll just quote this. If you want to turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Another reason why church is so important and in, in 1 Timothy 3.15, the Bible says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Which, by the way, the house of God and the church are used interchangeably also. That the, you know, when we congregate together, we're meeting in the house of God. Now, it's not that these walls and this pillar here and, you know, and these doors, that, that like this is somehow is the house of God. That's not what he's talking about. Just like this isn't, this building isn't the church. Sometimes you say, you know, I'm going to church and you're thinking about the building. Well, you know, I do my best to try to call it the church building because this is just the place that we meet together. The church literally is the people. It's the congregation. It's the people who are gathered together. It doesn't matter where you're physically located. That is the church. And that church is the house of God. I mean, you think about, you know, the Bible says our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, so our bodies uh, house the Holy Spirit, and when all of us come together as members, we make up a bigger body, which is known as the church, which is also known as then the house of God. Make sense? So the Bible says, but if I tarry long that thou mayest, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is being referred to, the church of the living God, the house of God, is being referred to as the pillar and ground of the truth. 
this is where we come together to hear and to be fed and to, and to learn just all the basic ground level pillars, foundational, fundamental truths of the scriptures. That is an extremely important reason to come to church is to get that. This is the pillar and ground of the truth, being together here in the church of the living God. These are, look, I didn't write this. This is what the scripture says. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 25. When, when referring to a, a man's relationship with his wife, a husband and wife relationship, there's the analogy given with Jesus Christ in the church, and it's a way of understanding one relationship based on this other relationship. You know, using Jesus Christ being the head of the church, well, the Bible says that the husband is also the head of the wife. And it's using both of these to, to help you to understand both of them, actually, both, both relationships. And in verse 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, I'm not going to get into all the teaching on husbands and wives, but what I'll point out here is the fact that Jesus Christ gave himself for what? For the church. If Jesus Christ gave himself for the church, what level of importance should that have in your life? Say, I thought Jesus Christ died for me. He did die for you. But he also died for the church. I mean, the church is just a group of people, but it's using this phraseology and this terminology specifically to say, hey, Jesus Christ loves the church and gave himself for the church. Church is important. Church is a pillar and ground of the truth. Jesus Christ gave his life for it. Maybe we should make church a priority and not just slack off on when we are going to gather together and potentially even forsake the gathering of ourselves together. And I've said this before, but I've seen it. The reason why is because I've seen this happen so many times. Don't let this happen to you. Okay? Decide in your heart, I am going to be in church for the rest of my life. Just make that decision. Make that decision up front. I will not get out of church. And it doesn't matter if you're backsliding in your life because here is the trap that so many people fall into. It's they start getting soft and weak and backsliding in other areas of their life and then they stop feeling spiritual. And you start to feel more carnal. And then they start to feel like, well, maybe even guilty over something that they've done, some sin that they've committed, and say, well, yeah, I don't feel right. I don't think I could go to church now. That is the progression then that just leads people from completely just getting out altogether and serving the Lord. If you've sinned and if you feel like that, look, there's a good reason to feel guilty when we get involved in sin. There's a good reason to have godly sorrow over what you've done because it should work repentance in you to, to get that sin out of your life and to get right with God. But what doesn't help is when you sin, you realize you sin, and you go, well, now I can't go to church because now you're just going to add sin upon sin. Now it's going to be that much harder for you to get out of that sin because now you're going to try to just go it alone instead of coming into church where people are going to that love you, are going to try to provoke you unto love and the good works and to help you to get back up because you've stumbled and fallen. That is another very important part of church. You need to be here for that. Don't, don't be, and you know, I don't know if men are more prone to this than women, but men have a tendency to just, you know, like, I mean, you're kind of in or out in general. And I know that's the way that I was, but we need to be humble enough to say, I'm just going to go. Because maybe I don't feel right, and I shouldn't feel right if I'm involved in sin, but I'm still going to just make sure I don't get out of church because that can be devastating. I need help. I need to, I need to hear the things of God. I need to be singing the hymns. I need to have this in my life to just help get me through and to help lift me back up. Making the decision and deciding in your heart and say, I'm not going to let anything come in the way of me making it to church. Unless it's, I mean, illness, I'm in the hospital, someone threw me in jail for preaching the word of God. You know, look, if there's something like that, I get it. But it needs to be having that priority. I mean, it, it, here's an easy way to think about it. You know, 
Do you ever just wake up and go, yeah, I don't really feel like going to work today. So I'm just not going to go to work. In general, people, in general, people still have the character to wake up and keep going to work, especially if you have a family, you have other people relying on you. You have to go to work. You have to go. You may not want to do it at all, but you still get up and go and you make it on time. What boggles my mind is that people can do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They can get up. They can make it to work on time. They say, oh, if I don't go on time, I'm getting written up and I might lose my job. Yeah, and that's going to keep you going to work on time. But then when it comes to church, oh, I can't make it to church on time. I can't wake up in the morning because it's just too early. You know, the 1030 start time is just way too early to get up on a weekend to get up and show up to church. Be resolved and say, I am going to treat this as more important than my job. I'm going to make sure that I show up to church and that I'm here because of what God's word says about church. And I don't want to fall. I don't want to backslide. I'm going to be here. You're in Ephesians 5. Flip over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a place that I usually, when I'm out soul winning, and, uh, you know, I, I don't bring this up very often at all, but sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I have church here at home. Or, I just pray to God and that's like my church. Right? These things, people just really downplay the importance of going to church and what it's for. I mean, Ephesians 5, Jesus Christ loved the church and, and, and died for the church. That should be pretty important. You say, well, sitting at home, are you, are you really in church? Are you, are you well, what does the Bible call church? The assembling of ourselves together? Are you in an assembly? You're at home. That's not really an assembly. Your family's always there. Right? You're not calling everyone together. Like, your family's already there. That's a normal day. An assembly is something that happens at a specific time and there's more people involved. That's an assembly. And now it doesn't have to be a hundred people. It doesn't have to be some huge number. But there is a set time for other belie for believers to come together as an assembly. It could be in a house. I'm not saying you can't have your church, your assembly in a house. I started a church in a house. That's not the point. But the point is these people who think that their own spirituality and their own praying to God is just a substitute for church and that somehow that's fine. That's impossible. The Bible gives us, the, or tells us, God has assigned positions for people to, to work in the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the church. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The purpose of these positions. So there's a purpose for a pastor. When you're, meeting, when you're, when you're at home praying to God, who's the pastor of your church there? Does he meet the qualifications that are spelled out in 1 Timothy chapter 3? Because those qualifications are given for a reason. Is it really the body of Christ? Are there other members showing up to your church? Other parts of that body? Or is that body just your body? There's a reason for it. God gave these different roles and, and gave people ability to fulfill these roles. He gave the apostles ability to fulfill their roles. He gave prophets ability to fulfill their roles. Evangelists, pastors, teachers, these abilities, these gifts to be able to fulfill these roles. And the purpose is for the perfecting of the saints. Saints are believers. They're sanctified in Jesus Christ. Perfecting, completing, helping to, to get you better spiritually for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith look at verse number 14 that we henceforth be no more children 
tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. When people are newly saved, you're spiritually young, you're spiritually a baby, you need to grow. Everybody needs to grow. And what's, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, physically, when we're born, we're going to grow. Right? I mean, you're going to, as long as you're being kept alive and you're being fed enough to, to survive, your body is going to grow. Spiritually speaking, though, you can be a baby for many, many, many years. So the amount of time involved with growth, it doesn't work the same as it does physically with human beings. And, and again, I'll be a good example of this. When I got saved, I didn't get plugged into church. I didn't really read my Bible very much. I didn't do much of anything that would help me grow at all. So for many, many, many years after I was born again, I still needed the milk of the word. And that's the way it is. And that's, but you know what? Church is going to help you with that. Coming to church, being around other believers is going to help you to learn and to grow and to help you so that you're not just tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that's out there. Because there are a lot of bad people that are trying to deceive believers and get them mixed up into all manner of weird false doctrines. It's out there. And, and that's why the Bible says that we shouldn't be children anymore. And you come to church to hear from these teachers and pastors that are going to be able to help teach you the word of God. So you're not tossed and carried about with every wind of doctrine by these people who are lying in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Turn over to uh, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and dig even more into like um, the role of a pastor or an elder within a church. Okay, pastor, bishop, elder are all used interchangeably in scripture for holding the same office. Uh, they, they have slightly different meanings in the actual word, you know, a bishop versus an elder versus a pastor but it's still the same function or same office that's being held within the church. And they all are just, just giving a different way of describing what, you know, for example, an elder should be someone who's spiritually elder, someone who knows the scripture well, someone who's been in ministry, someone who, you know, is not new, is not a novice, not a beginner. That's why that word elder is used. And then you have... Um, you know, someone who's a pastor, you think of a, you know, a pastor over a, a shepherd, right? Watching over the flock, things like that. These terms are used to help us to understand the different functions and aspects of a job of a pastor. Now, the more you understand this job, I think the more you'll also start to see another reason why it's important to be in church. When you start to see the, these reasons and, and these things that are, that are given specifically for elders, and for people in the church to say, wow, there's someone who's actually supposed to be doing these things in church. That's going to benefit me. Maybe I should come to church a little bit more also. And, um, and also, men, if you're considering being a pastor someday, if that's a goal for you, if you want to be a bishop, if you want to do that work, if you want to be in that ministry, pay attention to this because this is what you need to know. I mean, this is, this is part of the job, and, and this is what, if you're going to be a biblical, you know, pastor of a church, something, do it, filling a job that God wants you to do, this is what, this is what, uh, what it entails. So in John 21, we're going to look here in verse number 15. This is where Jesus is confronting Peter, right? You remember Peter denied Jesus Christ three times knowing him after he got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, you know, he, he three times he was, Jesus told him he's going to deny him. He's like, I'll never deny you. He denied him three times. 
Okay, and then after that, he thought on what he did, and he went out and he wept bitterly. He was really upset about it, really sad that, that he, he denied the Lord when confronted about it, instead of just being bold and, and professing, yes, I believe, you know, I'm with Jesus, right? We didn't do that. So now Jesus confronts Peter after the resurrection, everything else. You know, they're out fishing, they come back to shore, and Jesus is talking specifically to Peter. Now, Peter is an elder. Peter is a pastor of a church. Okay, that's a role that he ends up doing. And Jesus instructs him here, John uh, 21, verse 15, he says, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, that lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So, Obviously, this, you know, this three times he's asking him is tying back to when he denied him. But without going in depth and all that, when Jesus is asking Peter, hey, do you love me? Do you love me? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments elsewhere in Scripture. He says, you know, that's one of the things that we do. And he's telling Peter, do you love me? Well, then feed my lambs. Who are Jesus' lambs? It's other believers, right? Other people who are part of Jesus' fold. They're, they're saved. They're born again people. And he's instructing Peter, okay, if you love me, then you're going to feed the sheep. You're going to help them to grow. You're going to give them knowledge. You're going to minister unto them. You're going to work for them. You're going to watch over and protect and feed my sheep. And it's so important. He, tell, he asks them three times, well, do you really love me? Well, if you really love me, you're going to be feeding them. And if a, if a pastor, if someone in this position is going to take this seriously, what Jesus is telling Peter to feed a lamb, you know what? You've got to have that meal prepared. You've got to do preparation work. You can't just show up and be like, well, let's see what we've got for you to eat today. Um, there's some salt here. And I, don't, I think that bread's not stale yet. Let, you, know, you can't do that. Not if you're going to take the job seriously. Not if you're going to do the work that God has called out for the pastor to do. One of the jobs is to feed the sheep, feed the lambs. That's important. And that's, you know, that is a huge problem that so many people, especially these days, will say, you know, I'm going to this church. I don't really like it that much, though, because I don't feel like I'm being fed. There's a reason why that phrase is used, because that's something you're supposed to be receiving in church is being fed. And that's why earlier I said, you know, being in church is so important because that is a place to receive some feeding. Even if it's just crumbs that you're getting, go to church for the crumbs. Get whatever you can get. You know, lick that plate clean, whatever, whatever is being served up. Don't let any of it go to waste. Get whatever you can from that feeding. And, and you know, an admonition to, to people who are elders or, or bishops, you know, Prepare. Prepare the meal. Prepare the teaching. Prepare the feeding. Make sure people are well fed. You know, if your job is to watch over sheep and to keep them fed, you want them well fed. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, we're going to see this story where the Apostle Paul calls for elders of the church. We're going to start reading in verse number uh, 16. The Bible says, For Paul determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So what we're going to see here is Paul specifically addressing the elders in the church, okay? 
and we're going to get some really good insight here on what he's going to teach them and what's important for the elders. Verse number 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. So he's starting to bring up how he has been. Why? Because he's an example. He's a, when, when he starts talking about the things that he's done, he's relaying that to them so that they can do likewise in the church and follow his lead and follow his example. Okay, he says, you know what manner I've been with you all season, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. So he's humble, there's tears, there's temptations, there's trials, right? There's people coming after him and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. I didn't hold back. Whatever it is that you can be profited by, I'm going to let you know about it. Whatever it is, I'm going to tell you. But I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Said, You've seen how I've worked. You've seen how I've... Hey, whatever it is that I could possibly give unto you, I'm giving it to you. If this is going to help you. I'm not withholding. I'm not, I'm not censoring God's word. We're not skipping over certain passages because I don't think you're ready to handle that yet. Look, we're just going to give you the whole word of God, the whole counsel of God. That's what you should be receiving in church. That's the elder's job is to be able to do those things, to have humility, to fight through the tears and the temptations that go along with the job and be able to not hold back anything and to be able to do it all publicly. When, you, when you're in a church or a congregation where you have everything needing to be done in private and in secret, you know what? That starts to make me think of a cult. Yep. And Jesus didn't give us the light and the word and the truth to be held under a bushel. He didn't, he didn't mean for anything that he did to be done in private and in secret. He wants it all out in the open. And when you're preaching truth, and when, and when you're teaching truth, why would you cover it? And the job, especially of an elder, but of I, every believer, is not to be worried and concerned about what man can do unto you if there are repercussions for believing a certain way. Just preach it and preach it out in the open and preach it publicly and house to house. Like, we're just going to go out, this is the truth, and we're going to make sure everybody knows about it. That's the way that God... And expects things to be. And this is the instruction that the Apostle Paul is giving to these elders. Testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So now he's going on to, to still instruct these elders about, about himself. I'm going to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen, you know. But um, I'm doing this so I can finish my course with joy. And he says, I'm not going to see you guys anymore, probably just because of what's lying ahead of me. Verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says, I haven't stopped that. And, and this, this ties in with what he was saying earlier. I haven't kept back anything that's profitable for you. I'm not withholding. And, you know, men, if you want to be a pastor one day, you can't withhold the word of God. You got someone coming to your church and they're divorced and looking to get remarried, you know what? Don't withhold what the Bible says about that. Don't hold back from them. Now, that might mean they're going to leave your church because they don't want to hear it. So be it. You can't withhold. Why? Because it's profitable for them to hear about sin before they get into sin. 
Amen. It's profitable for everybody to hear the word of God and the truth of God's word to know what God thinks about things before they actually do them. The kids need to understand about fornication and how serious God deals with that. And you know what? That might offend some parents. I can't believe you talk about that. Or, I, you know, I've done that. I didn't think it was that bad. It doesn't matter. It's what God's word says. And we're not to withhold anything. And that's why he says, you know what? My, I'm pure from the blood of all men. You can't hold me responsible because I at least gave the warning. And that is a job of a bishop. To, to give the warning. To tell, hey, this is what God's word says. This is the counsel that you can get from God. This is what God thinks. Verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. This isn't just some tradition of a church. Well, there has to be a pastor because there's always been a pastor. The Holy Ghost makes people overseers of a flock. When a man is ordained to go and, and, and be pastor over church, the Holy Ghost makes you an overseer. And that's what he says, take heed unto yourselves and to the flock. Yeah, watch out for yourself and for the church, for everybody. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And again, another reference to Jesus Christ dying for and purchasing the church with his blood. Not just the individual soul, but the, the, whole, the whole congregation of people. For I know this, verse 29, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. More instruction for these elders. Hey, take heed, watch over, watch out for yourselves, watch over the flock. And after I'm leaving here, there's going to be wolves that are going to come in to your church and not spare the flock. They're going to come to destroy. Another job of the, the elder, of the bishop, of the pastor is to watch out for the wolves, to spot the wolves and, and to, to get them out from among the flock. That is another job that, that is extremely important within the church. Uh, he says in verse 30, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, even of your own selves, people are going to just come up within your church. He's talking about, one, wolves just coming in from the outside, coming in to infiltrate and to destroy, but then even just coming up from within the church. Watch out for these people. They're like the, the Absaloms, right? He came from within the house of David. He's from within, yet he starts drawing all the people away after him to come and follow him and to usurp the authority over David and to be, for him to become king. Watch out for that. Now, this is instruction on the elders, but obviously we all should be learning from this. Watch out for the people that are coming in and they're gonna start, what are they going to start doing? They're going to start bad-mouthing Pastor Burzens. Just like Absalom did with David, he starts bail. Oh, yeah, well, you know what I would do if, if I were king, if I were in charge, I would listen to you, I would do this, I would do that, I would be so much better at king. Watch out for people in church that are going to say, oh, yeah, Pastor Burzens, he's really bad at this, but you know, if I were pastor when I, or when I'm going to be pastor, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. They're trying to turn your heart away and trying to split the church and trying to just draw disciples after themselves. I've seen that happen too. Look, all of these things, it doesn't matter if I've seen them or not, they're in God's word, but God's word is true and these things happen. And we all need to be aware of it and especially someone who's going to be an elder or a pastor, you, you cannot be naive. You have to understand that these things will and do happen. So you have to be on guard and on the lookout for them. That's one of the jobs. And hey, find a church where you can feel comfortable that you have a pastor fulfilling that role. And, and what a blessing is that to go to a church where you can feel comfortable in that capacity and say, hey, there's someone actually trying to do their job that, that the Holy Ghost has made him overseer of to do that function. 
God knows that these problems are going to happen, but he doesn't say, well, then you just shouldn't go to church at all because there's going to be bad people that try to creep in. He says, no, just be aware of it. It's still important. Jesus Christ still gave his blood and shed his blood for the church. You still need to be there. You still need to hear the teaching and the preaching for the perfecting of the saints. You need all of that. But just be aware that these things are going to happen. And that's another job that he's saying, okay, well, elder, you need to watch out for this stuff. Because here's what's going to happen. Verse 31, therefore, watch. Just watch. Be on the lookout. Watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So we see how much the Apostle Paul cared for these people. He cared for the churches. He cared for them. He's saying, you know, I'm warning you day and night. And the reason why he's warning day and night, one, is because it's important, but two, because oftentimes people still just don't listen. For whatever reason, people just think, no, I don't think it's that bad. No, I, you're, you're getting a little too far, conspiracy or whatever. Everyone here is good. Everything's just fine. No one's trying to do that. And then it happens. He says, watch, remember, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the instruction that the Apostle Paul gives to these elders. And this is what an elder should be looking out for and doing if they're doing their job right. 1 Peter 5, we're almost done. Turn if you go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I told you before that, that Peter was an elder. He was a, he was a, a pastor. He was, not only was he an apostle, but he, he actually held the role of a bishop in church. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 1, is where we get the evidence for this. The Bible reads, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So this is the epistle of Peter. He's saying, I'm exhorting now, I'm trying to encourage the elders that are among you and the people he's writing the letter to. He's saying, I'm also an elder. I'm also in that position. He says, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So now he's telling them, basically the same thing the Apostle Paul was saying, feed the flock of God which is among you. Remember, Jesus told Peter specifically, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And now he's relaying that same information to these other elders saying, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. So yes, there is, you know, and, and these people that want to come in and destroy churches, there's no new thing under the sun. They're going to use various mechanisms. One of those mechanisms is like the, the Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, you know, where they, where they come in and they try to, just say, oh, well, who is this Moses guy, right? What makes you so special? Well, aren't we all children of God here? Can't we? All, you know, who, do you, who do you think you are lifting yourself up above everybody else? Who do you think you are to lead? And this is the attitude that's going to creep in and watch out for it because people are going to probably try to do the same exact thing here. Because they said there's nothing new under the sun. The tactics are all the same. We can look out for it and be, watch out. But the Bible's the one who says, you're given the oversight. You're the overseer. You're the one that's in charge. You're the one that's supposed to be watching out for these things because you're the elder that's been ordained by the Holy Ghost to do these things. So yes, there is biblical authority. There is biblical structure that it's not just a free-for-all and anyone can just come up and just and run things and lead the church. God has given jobs to specific people to, do, to, to perform different roles within the body. And it's biblical. But he says here, you don't take the oversight by constraint. Not that you have to or you're forced into doing this. 
You shouldn't be for like if you're going to be in this position of being an elder and taking the oversight, it shouldn't be something that you feel like you're forced to do. It's something that you should be doing willingly. You're getting into the job, you know what it entails and you want to do it. Not something you're just like, well, I have to do this. Because if you if you get put into a position, especially a position of like pastoring a church and you don't want to do it, you're not going to do a good job. You're not going to be doing the job you're supposed to be doing. And you could end up potentially doing more harm than good. So, and, and this is just an exhortation to any men that, that are thinking about pastoring, you know, make sure you know you really are on board and want to do it. And don't feel like you just have to. Because you don't. Just as, as in the Bible, God would send, or the, you know, the, the instruction was if any soldier is not willing to fight, and they're going to be, they're fearful, scared, and they don't want to do it. They have excuses. Like, send them home. Right. We want people who want to be there, want to be in the fight. They're going to fight. They know the Lord's with them, and they're going to do the, get in the fight and do those battles. Same thing with, with being an elder in a church. Look, if you're, if you're not up for it, then, then don't get in it. And not only that, be, you know, doing it willingly, he says, not for filthy lucre. But I've already, you don't get into this job for the money. Now, there are many people who financially prosper at being pastors of churches. Of course that exists. Look at the mega churches. Look at these. But if you're doing it for that reason, you're going to fail at fulfilling the word of God and, and what the whole point of it is. And, and I, think, I think that's extremely despicable. Because that is of utmost deception and just evil heart to use a position like a pastor, something that's supposed to be holy and sanctified and separated, just in general, doing work for God, right? Whether it's pastor or anything, but you're doing work for God and just being this evil and just being like, well, I'm just in it for the money. Because when you're just in it for the money, you don't care about the people. You're going to withhold things. You're not going to say everything that you should be saying. You're not going to be performing the job that he has for you. And you're not going to be humble and able to give of yourself when you're just in it for yourself and in it for the money. Now, I'm not going to get into all that. Obviously, I believe a pastor could be paid. There's nothing wrong with that for being compensated for working and doing this job and, and receiving of the gospel. As he, you know, but um, that's not the purpose of being a minister. The purpose is to help other people and to be focused on others, not on yourself and not on, definitely not on the money. Everybody is supposed to be focused on heavenly things, not on things of the earth. How much more the pastor? So don't go thinking you're going to make a whole bunch of money being a pastor of church because if you do things the right way. Now, I'm not saying you can't, that, that it's not possible, but that's not the right reason at all and that should not be your motivation and not even be a thought of, of getting into mystery. In fact, I would plan on not having money at all if you plan on taking that job. Just plan on that and then you don't worry about the rest and whatever, whatever ends up, whatever you end up being compensated for, praise God for, but that's not, uh, it's not for the money. Verse number three. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. And look at God's heritage is his church. That's God's heritage. Church is important. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So the job of the elder isn't to be just telling everybody what to do and lording over and saying, you need to do this. You. You're being the ex example. You're setting the pace, going, hey, come with me out soul winning. Come with me as we do work here. Come with me as we do, you know, be the example. This is how we do things. It's not just this, this you know, it's not like the military. The, the pastor isn't the drill sergeant. You know, stand up straight, you know, get. <laughs> Obviously, we, wanna, we, we want the church to be a glorious church, so back to the he Ephesians chapter 5 reference, without spot, without wrinkle. Right? We want ourselves to, to, to 
get our get ourselves cleaned up. But the pastor's supposed to help do that by example and by teaching, not by just lording over people. Oh, I saw you at the movie theater. What were you doing there, huh? You know, like that's not that's not the job. That's not the role of the pastor is to be micromanaging and watching over what everybody's doing and lording over the flock. Now that being said, we're not to be lord, you know, pastors are not to be lords over the flock. But that doesn't mean that they're also not in charge or have rule in the house of God either. And the last place I'll return is um, Hebrews chapter 13. I'll read from 1 Timothy 3 where it goes, gives the qualifications of the, the bishop. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 4 and 5, there's, there's the qualification given, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So one of the qualifications you look for in a bishop is, are, do they have their house in order and are his children in subjection to him? Meaning that if he says something, do they respect him? Are they going to listen to him? If he says, hey, sit down, they're going to get up and sit down. He says, don't do that. They're going to stop, you know, that he's in charge of his household. That is one qualification, because if you can't do that, even just within your own house, well, how are you going to look over and, because he said you can't rule his own house, then how are you going to rule in the church of God? In Hebrews 13, you say, well, I don't like that word rule. The ruling. Well, it's a biblical word. Look at Hebrews 13, verse number 7. Three times in Hebrews 13, it refers to someone ruling over. And this, is, this is, again, in reference to the, uh, the elder or the bishop of the church. Hebrews 13, 7, remember them which have the rule over you. You say, well, well, that could be anyone. That could be the government who have spoken unto you the word of God. That's not the government. Remember them the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith follow. Right? As an example, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. And I, I've, I've taught this before, just real briefly. Conversation isn't just the words, like when, if Brother Steve and I were having a conversation, the way that we would use the term today of just talking with each other. Conversation is more than that in uh, the sense of when the, the Bible was, was translated in, in the 1600s. Conversation has more to do with, with how you behave and all of your mannerisms, not just the, the words that come out of your mouth. So considering the end of their conversation means the end of their, their way of life, like what they're doing and how they're living and how they're interacting with people. And, you know, that's their conversation. So he's saying, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow. They're being the example, right? But they have the rule over you in the scope of the church. Not in your personal life, not in what you're going to eat, not in every other aspect of your life. Within the church. Uh, jump down to verse number 17. The Bible says again, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Well, let's talk about the government. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account. So how about someone who's watching for your souls because... That person has a job to give account to God over, the, over the, the job that you do with the flock, over the overseer. See, with authority comes responsibility. Anything that happens, you know, people say, oh man, it must be great to be the husband at home and to be the father. You know, you're, you're just in charge of everything. Yeah, you know what comes along with that? Responsibility. Because at the end of the day, you know who's responsible when things don't go right in my house? I'm responsible. If my wife doesn't do the right thing, if my children doesn't do the right thing, I'm responsible. That's what goes along with that authority. Just like at work, you know, when things end up going wrong, you know, at the end of the day, who's responsible for everything running right in a business? The boss, the CEO, the person who's ultimately in charge. They're responsible that everything is being done right. Even if what happened wasn't directly their fault, they're responsible for it all. The pastor in the church is responsible for the souls of the people in the church, for the flock, for them being fed, being watched over, protected. 
But at the same token, that same person has the rule within the house. Obey them to have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And this is being directed not to the elders, it's directed to the people. He's saying, you know, look, just obey and, and submit yourself to them. Well, I don't like the way, just look. They're watching out for your souls. They have to give an account. So just do it so that they can continue to do their job with joy and not just be, you know, upset about it because, man, no one's listening to what I have to say. You know, I'm looking out for these people. They don't understand that. And there's, I'm getting fought every inch when you've got someone trying to just, you know, look out for you and give account for your souls. That's what, this is what the teaching is giving you here. Because he's saying that's unprofitable for you if you're just causing a lot of grief for the person who has the rule over you. And then verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They have at least salute you. So three times in that passage, you see, you're talking about people who have the rule over you. You know, I, I bring all this up because I think it's important to see, especially in Hebrews 13, when you see that, hey, there's someone that's giving account for my soul. Like, I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a great benefit to have. The same way I believe it's great for the wife to not have to worry about, well, where is our food going to worry? That's my job. I'll worry about that. Right? You can focus on other things. I'm going to watch out for this. The, the, the pastor in a church has a job and a role, and he's supposed to be looking out for the souls of the people here. And is any pastor perfect? No. No. But it is their job. And if you've got someone doing the job right, there's just one more reason to come to church. Because you've got someone that's going to love you, that's going to look out for you, that's going to try to feed you and make sure that your life is going to go the best way that it possibly can because he's given you all of the counsel of God. That's a pretty good reason to just stay in church and say, you know what, this is important for me because somebody cares. And this church isn't unique in that sense. This, these are the instructions that God's given to every church. Now, they may not all be following it, but you know what? At least right here, you have someone that can honestly say that I'm trying my best to watch out for everybody in this church and I care about every single person in this church. And you may not always understand that or feel that or you may think you're being neglected and I'm sorry for that, but you have somebody who's trying their best to do that. So if you come to this church, you've got someone who's going to try to fulfill these roles for you. So why not make it a priority and come in and learn and grow together, provoke one another into love and good works and, and stay strong in faith. And you know what? If you decide that this church isn't right for you, you also have the person to have a rule over you. We don't have the rule to say, no, you have to keep coming here. Go somewhere else. But don't get out of church. Find some other church. Find some other pastor that's going to be able to lead better and watch over your soul better and do the work better. Go ahead. Do it. Be in the best church that you can find. It's going to work for you. But, but don't get out of church because church is extremely important. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for instituting the church. Lord, I pray that you would please help our church to grow, that you would add members to our church, help us to function in unity and be able to do all the work that you've laid out for us, dear God. I pray that you would please help me to, to, to oversee the church that, that you've entrusted here. And I, and I pray that you would just, um, just help us all to grow and to learn and to, and to do more for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.